Hey guys, welcome back to the solutions video. What we're going to do now is look into question six to 10. Obviously a, a change of pace here. What we have is a more physics question. So after reading the stem, let's jump down to uh, question number six. What we have is given that the load in the apparatus in figure one is the weight of the forearm itself, the mechanical advantage of the force exerted by the flexor muscle, muscle is what? So what, we're, what I'm going to try to do is try to pinpoint exactly where in the stem we're looking at mechanical advantage. And very specifically, what I'm going to use is this definition over here. So what this de definition over here tells me is that the mechanical advantage equals the effort of the arm, its distance, divided by the resistance arm distance. Fantastic. So to me, what that is basically saying is that the mechanical advantage is taken by dividing the distance from the pivot to, to the, to the uh, I guess, insertion point where the effort is actually being conducted within this lever, and that being divided by the distance of the pivot point to where the resistance load is actually found. And so based off the information in the stem, what we find is that the tendon from the pivot point is actually five centimeters. Now, what we've got to basically ask now is where is the distance of the load? And so the arm itself, we find that it is 50 centimeters long. Now, when we're working with something like this, we need to take the center of mass. And so obviously in this case, the center of mass of this forearm will be 25 centimeters. Keeping in mind again that the forearm's length was 50 centimeters. So the mechanical advantage in this case, if we're going to convert them to meters, we have 0.05 over the 0.25, we could have kept it in uh, centimeters because they're both a scale factor by the same of five over 25. That's going to give me one over five. And so what we have is a mechanical advantage of 0.2. So not bad question, 6B, fantastic. A little bit trickier, what we have in question seven, what is the force required by the flexor muscle in the arm to hold the forearm in a perpendicular position with respect to the arm shown in figure one? So what we have here is more, um, more I guess, uh, understanding necessary of torque. Now the first thing when it comes to torque is obviously we have the, uh, the formula that we have here, but what we were told also was the force had to be perpendicular to, to, that, to that lever. And so what that means is whatever this force is that's coming out from the tendon itself, we need to basically isolate what's actually occurring within the vertical, I guess, sorry, within the perpendicular direction to the actual forearm. And so whatever this force is, we need to work out its vertical component, directly vertical, because obviously this part over here is horizontal, and we need to work out uh, what, how, how much of that, uh, you know, I guess, vector is within that vertical direction. So what I'm going to, do, going to do is draw out another lever over here. And I'm going to draw in that tendon that's coming out. And this right here is the F. Now, in order to work out this, uh, this vertical direction, if I'm going to draw it out over here, if this whole angle is 120 and we know that this is 90 degrees coming out to the right, then what we have inside is 30 degrees. So if the hypotenuse is F, and what we're actually after is the uh, 90 degree perpendicular vector of that force, we're, at, we're working with here, X or, or the adjacent. So if we were to work out what X is over here, we've got uh, cos 30 equals the adjacent over hypotenuse. Or what we have is X equals F times cos of 30. And I can't be bothered working that out because of the fact that it's given. And so what we have is F times 0 0.87, fantastic. So now what we have, and I'm gonna simplify this now, is draw a more, I guess, intuitive intuitive diagram. Well, we have a two forces that are, act, that are acting in this, I guess, rotational equilibria. We have the tendon that's coming out here, and now I can actually replace that with its vertical component, and its force is F times 0 0.87. The distance between here and here was five centimeters, as we knew before. The next force that we have acting on this is the center of mass of the forearm, and that is going to act vertically downward. And the weight of that forearm is what's going to be the force. So the weight of that forearm, what do we have? We have a mass of 
and I'm going to take the uh, gravitational acceleration as 10, and what that gives me is 15 newtons. So now what I'm going to do is take this anti-clockwise direction as being positive in this rotational um, in this rotational system, and then obviously going uh, clockwise down here is going to be the negative. Now for this to be in rotational equilibria, what we need is the positive uh, torque to match up in the opposite direction to the negative torque, and so the net torque will actually be zero. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to set up an equation, I'm gonna have the net torque as zero, and that is going to be the torque in the positive direction, which is the F times 0 0.87, that's the force, but then have a look here, we also need the distance. So I'm going to times that by 0 0.05, times that, that is. And then in the, so minusing that in the negative direction, what we have is the 15 newtons times by its distance, which was 0 0.25. Fantastic. Now what I can do is take that over. I'm going to have 15 times 0 0.25 equals F times 0 0.87 times 0 0.5. Now if I times both sides by 10, uh, what I can do, oh, I've missed a zero, 0, 0.05. If I times both sides by 10, I can very, uh, very nicely get rid of those decimals. So now that will be gone. Now what I'm doing is actually just multiplying it by five, so that's a little bit easier. Fantastic, that is not point, that is gone. Fantastic, so then I, if I divide both sides by five, I have three times 25 equals F times 0 0.87. Three times 25, 75 equals F times 0 0.87. Then finally what I'm left with is F equals Oops, 75 divided by 0 0.87. Fantastic, now in this case here, I don't wanna work that out directly. What I'm gonna do instead is try to find what roughly is that, uh, what, it, what is that number? Now as this is, a, that this is a decimal, 75 divided by 0 0.87 is basically just gonna be something that's greater than 75. And if I can look at the options and I can see that there's only one that is greater than 75, then we've got a winner. Going down to question seven, there is only one option that's greater than 75. And so without even working it out, I can, I can basically see that the, um, that the force that the tendon required in order to keep this in rotational equilibria was 86. How much of it was in the vertical or perpendicular component? 75. Fantastic, okay. So we'll get rid of all of this. Give us some room. Cool. Okay, what vertical force, if any, must be exerted directly on the elbow joint for the forearm to remain in this position? So now, when we've got something like this, it seemed, we already knew that if we were to keep the force by, um, by I guess, 86 newtons in the, in the tendon direction or 75 perpendicular to the forearm, we would be in rotational equilibrium. But that does not mean that the entire arm itself wouldn't be accelerating upwards or downwards. So what we've got to do is find uh, in, the, in the vertical component, can we also keep that net force to be zero? So what we have now, is the lever arm with the center of mass coming down. We have that being 1.5 times 10, so that was the 15 newtons. Then what we also had was the tendon and the vertical component, or the perpendicular component to the forearm of that was 75 newtons. So now, similar to what we did before, what I'm going to do is take this part being the positive direction and downward being the negative direction. What I want is for all forces to be zero because that's how I'm gonna get the net uh, zero vertical component. The zero is going to equal 75, positive as it's in the positive direction, minus the 15, right, minus the 15, plus something at the elbow. The elbow being over here, I'm not sure which direction that's gonna be. I keep it positive. If it turns out to be a negative, that would mean downward. Fantastic. So what we've got is zero equals 60 plus x, and therefore x equals negative 60. So being negative 60, what that tells me is we should have negative, uh, sorry, 60 newtons pointing downward at the elbow in order to keep a vertical equilibria going. And so that will lead me to B. Cool. All right, next question. 
10 kilogram weight was planted on the free end of the forearm, what would be closest, what would be the closest force required for the flexor muscle in the arm to hold the forearm stable in that position described in figure one? Okay, so what we have here is, is sort of like a new diagram over here. We have the tendon still coming out now, I don't know what the force is. This was 120 degrees that distance there being five centimeters coming down clearly not to scale the weight of the forearm was 15 newtons that was uh, 25 centimeters from the pivot coming down here what we have is a 10 kilogram weight times it by acceleration gives me 100 newtons so now what i have is something that's weighing me down from the palm of my hands so again, what I need to do, that should be 120. Again, what I need to do is isolate what components are going in the positive direction and what components are going in the negative direction. And basically I need all those to uh, equal out zero. So it could be in rotational equilibrium. I have zero equals, what I'm gonna do now is not use the uh, convert everything to meters. Instead, I'm gonna keep it in centimeters as we saw before, because of the fact that we'd be taking or multiplying 10 into every single component, it doesn't matter. So we have zero equals, so I'm gonna chuck in the distance for this over here, the distance was five, and I'm gonna times that by the force, and as we saw before, what we needed to do was multiply that by cos 30. Now in the opposite direction, what do we have? Negative 15 times, that's over here, times it by its distance, which was the center of mass distance, and that was 25, and then again, minus the 100, minus the 100 over here, times the 50, uh, that's because that was the distance of the entire forearm. Fantastic, as we can see through those calculations, every, there's, a, there's a, a common factor of five within all of those terms, so I'm gonna take that out, there's a zero on the other side. I've got zero equals F, I'll convert that cos 30 into 0 0.87, 0 0.87, right, minus now three times 25 minus 100, times 10. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Let me get rid of all this. Fantastic, we have, and I'm gonna take everything that's negative onto the other side now. Now the three times 25 will give me 75. Cool, the uh, 100 times the 10 will give me 1000. And that's going to be equal to F times 0 0.87. Now I've got 1075 equals F times 0 0.87, and so finally I've got F equals 1075 over 0 0.87. Okay, another, another, um, another, I guess, fraction that I don't really wanna deal with because of the fact that it is so time consuming. So what I'm gonna do is have a look at the options that are actually present. So far, obviously something divided by the decimal will inflate it more. If we divide you know, 100 by two, um, that will become 50. If I divide 100 by 0 0.5, that will become 200. So with, with that def decimal, it's going to inflate it upwards. So the issue is, is, the, is this uh, division process over here, is that going to make this is 1075 closer to 2000 or closer to 1000? This is where a bit of intuition has to come into play. That 1075 is roughly 1000. If I was to divide that by 0 0.5, that would take me to the 2000. Now, because of the fact that that 0 0.87 is closer to one than it is to 0 0.5, what that means is we're actually not going beyond that 1500 Newton mark. And as a result, we will still actually be closer to 1000. And so as a result, it is not actually closer to uh, B, even though it does inflate that 0 0.75, it will still remain at A. So without doing the very nitty gritty calculations, I can still work out the answer there. Fantastic, final question for this stem. If the angle pictured in figure one was increased, okay, so what are we working with? The angle in figure one over here, if the angle over here was increased, what would occur? So the first, in all of the, in all of the uh, options here, it says that the force exerted by the flexor muscle would increase or decrease. 
Now, if the angle becomes increased over here, if the angle becomes increased, what would actually be going on? Let's draw a simple diagram. We worked out based off on the left here that we've got a we've got a diagram that looks like this. We have F, which is what's coming out of the tendon. We have X, which was corresponding to the actual, I guess, torque that was going on. We needed to work out that perpendicular um, amount of force that we're working with. And in here, that was 30. Now, if we were to increase that angle of the of the flexor there, what we're actually doing is creating something like this. Let's say we increased it so that inside that was actually 60. The F is still gonna stay the same. That's, that's oh, well, I'm saying that it will stay the same. What impact will that have on the uh, perpendicular component? If we were to increase that angle and keep that the same, we're actually going to drop that new X. And so if we drop that new X, we actually would have to increase the force if we wanted to remain at equilibria. And so with that being the case, we can knock out A and C. Cool, because this is referring to increase. Now we have to deal with mechanical advantage. Going back to how we define mechanical advantage, it was related to the distance of where we were applying that force divided by the distance of where like the actual load was. And in that case, that was the distance of the tendon to the pivot point divided by the distance of the center of mass to the pivot point. Now, as this is not actually changing, we are not altering the mechanical advantage. And so what we would be led to is B. Fantastic.